afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. And I wanted to thank absolutely everyone for adjusting your schedules, the readers, um, the musicians, the entire children's choir. Uh, we found out very, very late in the game that we would have been competing last night with an amplified rock band concert. And that would have been very undignified. So our evening with Tolstoy, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, and Prokofiev has become a lovely afternoon with these marvelous writers and composers. I would like to welcome everyone to this beautiful Senate chamber. Thank you for hosting us again. We did this two years ago when we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the birth of Chekhov and the 100th anniversary of the death of Tolstoy. We read passages from Chekhov and Tolstoy and we listened to a fabulous, fabulous uh, first movement of the Kreutzer Sonata of Beethoven, which influenced Tolstoy so tremendously in writing um, his Kreutzer Sonata. And we decided to do this again. It was so much fun. Um, what we're trying to reconstruct here is a 19th century salon. We never rehearse together. We come for this one performance. The readers will read on their own. The performers practice on their own. There is no program so that you wouldn't spend your time reading the notes. We just want you to enjoy this wonderful event. Um, a few words about 1812 War and Peace and Tolstoy. Um, it's a 1,200 page book, which we finished reading last weekend. It took us 51 and a half hours. We read it in front of the old Capitol with the wonderful Napoleon exhibit in the background. I encourage all of you to visit the Napoleon exhibit both in the old Capitol and at the um, uh, Black Box Theater at the Iowa Memorial Union. Um, the museum exhibits will be here through December and January. So please, please avail yourselves of them. Um, War and Peace is a very long novel, and it's a glorious novel. What you are going to get here is just a glimpse into four passages of this novel. The first passage is from volume one, the second passage is from volume two, the third from volume three, and the fourth passage is from the first appendix. Um, I will introduce each of the readings, and the music was chosen to coincide with the spirit of the passage. Um, our first reader is Craig Willis. He's going to read an absolutely marvelous passage about Andrei Balkonsky lying on the battlefield of Austerlitz. He lived a moment of earthly glory. It was witnessed by Napoleon Bonaparte. And now he has to make the choice between earthly glory and transcendent glory, which is unreachable in the here and now. The music that you are going to hear after this passage is the first movement of Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata, which was published in 1799, the year Napoleon becomes first consul of France. Good afternoon. On the Pratzen Hill, in the same place where he fell with the staff of the standard in his hands, Prince Andrei Volkonsky lay bleeding profusely and, unbeknownst to himself, letting out soft, pitiful, childlike moans. Towards evening, he stopped moaning and became completely still. He did not know how long he was unconscious. Suddenly, he felt himself alive again and suffering from a burning and rending pain in the head. Where is it? That lofty sky, which I never knew till now and saw today, was his first thought. And I never knew this suffering either, he thought. Yes, I knew nothing, nothing till now. But where am I? He began to listen and heard the sounds of approaching hoofbeats and the sound of voices speaking French. He opened his eyes. Over him again was that same lofty sky with floating clouds rising still higher through which showed the blue of infinity. He did not turn his head and did not see those who, judging by the sounds of the hooves and voices, had ridden up to him and stopped. The horsemen who had ridden up were Napoleon, accompanied by two adjutants. Bonaparte, riding over the battlefield, had given final orders about the reinforcement of the batteries fire, firing at the Dam of Oxt and was looking at the dead and wounded who were left on the battlefield. Fine men, said Napoleon, looking at a dead Russian grenadier who his face buried in the ground and his nape blackened, lay on his stomach, one of his already stiff arms flung far out. The ammunition for the guns in positions is exhausted, sire. 
said just then one of the adjutants, having come up from the batteries that were firing on Augs. Bring up more from the reserves, said Napoleon, and riding on a few paces, he stopped over Prince Andre, who lay on his back, the staff of the standard fallen beside him. The, sta the standard had already been taken as a trophy by the French. There's a fine death, said Napoleon, looking at Volkonsky. Prince Andre understood that it had been said about him, and it was Napoleon speaking. He heard the man who had said these words being addressed as sire, but he heard these words as if he was hearing the buzzing of a fly. He was not only not interested, he did not even notice, and at once forgot them. He had a burning in his head. He felt that he was losing blood, and he saw above him in that distant same lofty eternal sky. He knew that it was Napoleon, his hero, but at that moment Napoleon seemed to him such a small, insignificant man compared with what was now happening between his soul and this lofty, infinite sky with clouds racing across it. To him, it was all completely the same at that moment, who was standing over him or what he said about him. He was only glad that people had stopped over him and only wished that those people would help him and bring him back to life, which seemed so beautiful to him because he now understood it so differently. He gathered all his strength in order to stir and produce some sound. He stirred his leg weakly and produced a weak, pitiful moan that moved even him to pity. Ah, he's alive, said Napoleon. Lift up this young man and take him to the first aid station. Having said that, Napoleon rode on further to meet Marshal Lanay, who was riding up to the emperor, taking off his hat and congratulating him on the victory. Prince Andre remembered nothing more. He lost consciousness from the terrible pain of being put on the stretcher, the jolting while he was being carried, and the probing of his wound at the first aid station. He came to only at the end of the day when he, along with the other Russians, wounded and, and captured officers, uh, was taken to the hospital. During this time, he felt somewhat fresher and could look around and even speak. And there's an interlude of treatment. Prince Andre, who, uh, to complete the trophy of prisoners, was also brought out before the eyes of the emperor, could not fail to attract his attention. Napoleon evidently remembered seeing him on the battlefield and turning to him used that same appellation of young man under which Bolkonsky had been imprinted on his memory the first time. And you, young man, how do you feel? <coughs> Though five minutes earlier, Prince Andre had been able to say a few words to the soldiers transporting him. Now, with his eyes fixed directly on Napoleon, he was silent. To him, at that moment, all the interests that occupied Napoleon seemed so insignificant. His hero seemed so petty to him with his petty vanity and joy and victory compared with that lofty, just, and kindly sky, which he had seen and understood that he was unable to answer him. Then, too, everything seemed so useless and insignificant compared with that stern and majestic way of thinking called up in him by weakness from loss of blood, suffering, and the expectation of imminent death. Looking into Napoleon's eyes, Prince Andre thought about the insignificance of grandeur, about the insignificance of life, the meaning of which no one could understand, and about the still greater insignificance of death, the meaning of which no one among the living could understand or explain. The emperor, receiving no answer, turned away and as he rode off, addressed one of the officers. Have these gentlemen looked after and taken to my bivouac? Have my doctor, Latre, examined their wounds? Goodbye, Prince Repnin. And touching up his horse, he galloped on. On his face was the radiance of self-satisfaction and happiness. The soldiers who had carried Prince Andre and had taken from him the little golden icon hung on her brother by Princess Maria, seeing the kindness with which the emperor treated the prisoners, hastened to return the icon. Prince Andre did not see 
how or by whom it was put back on him, but suddenly on his chest over the uniform, a little icon on a fine gold chain turned up. It would be good, thought Prince Andre, looking at this icon, which his sister had hung on him with such feeling and reverence. It would be good if everything was as clear and simple as it seems to Princess Maria. How good it would be to know where to look for help in this life and what to expect after it, there, beyond the grave. How happy and calm I'd be if I could say it now, Lord, have mercy on me. But to whom shall I say it? Either it is an indefinable, unfathomable power which I not only cannot address, but which I cannot express in words, the great all or nothing, he said to her himself. Or is it that God, whom Princess Maria has sown in there, in this amulet, nothing, nothing is certain except the insignificance of everything I can comprehend and the grandeur of something incomprehensible, but most important.
first moment of the Pathétique because it really captures the spirit of the last um, chapter of the first volume of War and Peace. Andre is bleeding on the battlefield. Andre is abandoning his desire for earthly glory, for this kind of passion that is expressed in the first moment of the Pathétique. And he is beginning to look for glory that reaches beyond the here and now, glory that cannot be captured by someone who is alive and seeking this kind of earthly glory as Napoleon Bonaparte, the hero that Andre idolized earlier in the, in the volume. Tolstoy described events like this one in, um, in War and Peace. Um, his characters get together often to uh, sing in duets, in trios, and quartets. These events are very spontaneous. Uh, Western music is performed continuously throughout War and Peace. They play Mozart. Um, Beethoven was often played in the Tolstoy household, both at Jasna Palana, his country estate, and at Hamolniki, his Moscow home. Um, his son, one of his sons, was a fabulous pianist, and he performed Beethoven continuously. Um, Tolstoy loved the sound of Beethoven. At the same time, Tolstoy had a very hard relationship with art, Western art, and art in general. What Tolstoy preferred was the naturalness and spontaneity of Russian music, of Russian folklore, and of Russian culture. Um, in the next passage, you will hear about Natasha Rostova, our main female character of War and Peace. They are visiting Natasha and her brothers, Petya and Nikolai, are visiting their uncle, who lives a very Russian life. Um, Russian peasants walking around barefoot on his estate, borzoi dogs. They just came back from a wolf hunt. They're having a wonderful Russian meal. And what they hear in the background of their conversation is the sound of the Russian balalaika, very, very different from Western music um, that, um, that Tolstoy heard in his home all the time. What is so important for Tolstoy is to underscore the Russianness of his characters. After all, they are facing the French on the battlefield. The French become the enemy of the Russians. Those very same Russians who speak French in their homes, who consume French culture, who consume French food, who listen to French music, all of a sudden, Russian aristocracy reaches an identity crisis. They have to realize that they are not French, that they are very much the Russian. And Tolstoy makes this beautiful transition with Natasha Rostova um, performing a Russian dance. The music that you will hear after this, um, this reading is um, the music of Tchaikovsky, the most Russian of the Russian composers, and you're going to hear two wonderful romances, one based on the poem of uh, Nikrasov and the second based on a poem by Lermontov. Carol? From the corridor, the sounds of a balalaika came, became clearly audible played by someone who was obviously a master of it. Natasha had long been listening to those sounds and now went to the corridor to hear them better. That's my Mitka, the coachman. I brought him a good balalaika. I like it, said the uncle. It was the uncle's custom that when he came back from the hunt, Mitka would play the balalaika in the bachelor hunter's room. The uncle liked listening to this music. How good, excellent, really, said Nikolai, with a sort of involuntary disdain, as if he was ashamed to confess that he found the sounds very pleasing. What do you mean, excellent, Natasha said with reproach, feeling the tone with, with which her brother had said it. It's not excellent. It's simply lovely. Just as the uncle's mushrooms, honey, and liqueurs seem the best in the world to her, so this song, too, seemed to her at this moment the height of musical loveliness. More, please, more, Natasha said through the door as soon as the balalaika fell silent. Mitka tuned up and again began picking out the tune of Barinya. It had its leaps and runs. The uncle sat and listened, his head inclined to one side with a barely perceptible smile. The melody of Barinya was repeated some 100 times. 
The balalaika was tuned several times, and again the same sounds rippled out, and the listeners were not bored, but only wanted to hear this playing again and again. <clears throat> Anisya Fyodorovna came in and leaned her corpulent body against the doorpost. Listen, if you please, little countess, she said to Natasha with a smile very much like the uncle's <laughs> smile. He plays nicely, she said. Oh, this part here he doesn't do right, the uncle said suddenly with an energetic gesture. He should pour it on. It's the darndest thing. Pour it on. And can you do it, Natasha said. The uncle smiled without answering. Go, Anishushka. See whether my guitar has all its strings or not. <laughs> I haven't set hand to it for a long time, darndest thing gave it up. Anisya Fyodorovna went eagerly with her light step to fulfill the master's request and fetched the guitar. The uncle, not looking at anyone, blew the dust off, rapped on the face of the guitar with his bony fingers, tuned it up, and settled comfortably in his armchair. He took a hold of the guitar and with a wink at, An at Anisya Fyodorovna, did not begin Barinya, but struck one sonorous pure chord and calmly but firmly began at a very slow tempo to pick out the well-known song Down the Road wo, Old Way. At once the tune of the song began to sing in the souls of Nikolai and Natasha. Anisya Fyodorovna blushed and covering her face with her kerchief, left the room laughing. The uncle continued to pick out the song clearly and with energetic firmness, gazing at the place Anisya Fyodorovna had left. Something laughed slightly in his face and it laughed especially when as the song got going, the tempo quickened and in running passages there would be a sudden break. Lovely, lovely, Uncle Moore. More, cried Natasha as soon as he finished. She jumped up from her place, embraced her uncle, and kissed him. Nikolenka, Nikolenka, she said, glancing at her brother as if asking him, what on earth is it? Nikolai also liked the uncle's playing very much. The uncle played the song a second time. Anisya Fyodorovna's smiling face again appeared in the doorway and behind her some other faces. And the uncle played again with a skillful run and then broke off. Come, come, dearest uncle, Natasha moaned in such an imploring voice as though her life depended on it. The uncle got up and it was as if there were two men in him. One smiled gravely at the jolly fellow while the jolly fellow performed a naive little caper before dancing. Come, niece, cried the uncle, waving to Natasha with the hand that had broken off the cord. Natasha threw off the handkerchief she had wrapped around her, ran and placed herself in front of her uncle, and arms akimbo made a movement with her shoulders and stopped. Where? how and when this little countess, brought up by an emigre French woman, sucked this Russian spirit in from the Russian air she breathed, where had she gotten these ways which should have long been supplanted by the shawl dance? Yet that spirit and these ways were those very inimitable, unstudied Russian ones which the uncle expected of her. As soon as she stood there, smiling triumphantly, proudly, and with sly merriment, the fear which had first seized Nikolai and all those present that she would not do it right went away, and they began to admire her. She did it exactly right, and so precisely, so perfectly precisely, that Anisya Fyodorovna wept through her laughter looking at this slender, graceful countess brought up in silk and velvet so foreign to her, who was able to understand everything that, w that was in Anisia and in Anisia's father 
and in her aunt, and in her mother, and in every Russian.
romances leave us breathless. I need to correct myself. The first romance was um, set to a poem of Alexei Tolstoy, and the second one was a translation of Goethe. Um, Natasha is Russian, and it comes as no surprise to us. All of us expected <coughs> to find out sooner or later in the novel that she's quintessentially Russian. What Tolstoy is trying to tell us is the Russians are going to tr triumph over Napoleon, not because their strategy is better, not because they are better tacticians, not because they have superior knowledge derived from books, but because viscerally, quintessentially, deep down, intuitively, they know that they're going to win. The um, passage that you're going to hear now is a passage from the third volume, the most military volume of War and Peace. It describes the Battle of Baradino, which was fought precisely 200 years ago this year. Um, Natasha and General Kutuzov, who is in charge of the Russian army, never meet in the novel. And yet Natasha is described very similarly to Kutuzov. They are both quintessentially Russian. When Prince Andrei visits Kutuzov at his um, post um, before the Battle of Baradino, he catches Kutuzov reading a French novel. And yet he knows that despite the French novel, that despite all of this talk about strategizing for the next day, Kutuzov is quintessentially Russian. And what enables this victory is Kutuzov, Kutuzov's intuitive understanding of the spirit of the army. After we hear this passage from volume three, the Crescendo Children's Choir will sing two choruses that are uh, based on, both, both of them written by Rachmaninoff, the first one based on a poem by Nikrasov and the second one poem by Lermontov. Kutuzov sat, hanging his gray head and his heavy body sagging on the rug-colored bench in the same place where Pierre had seen him in the morning. He did not give any instructions, but only agreed or disagreed with what was suggested to him. Yes, do that, he replied to various suggestions. Yes, yes, go, dear boy, have a look, he said now to one of his attendants, now to another. Or he said, no, there's no need, we'd better wait. He listened to the reports brought to him, gave orders when his subordinates demanded it, but as he listened to the reports, it seemed that he was not interested in the meaning of the words being said to him, but that something else, in the expression of the face, in the tone of the reporter's speech interested him. By many years of military experience he knew, and by his old man's mind he understood that no man can lead hundreds of thousands of men struggling with death. And he knew that the fate of a battle is decided not by the commander-in-chief's inst instructions, not by the position of the troops, not by the number of cannon or of the people killed, but by that elusive force known as the spirit of the troops. And he watched this force and guided it as far as it lay in his power. The general expression of Kutuzov's face was one of concentrated calm attention and a strain that barely overcame the weariness of a weak and old body. At 11 o'clock in the morning, he was brought news that the flesh occupied by the French had been retaken, but that Prince Bagration had been wounded. Kutuzov said, ah, and shook his head. Ride to Prince Piotr Ivanovich and find out what and how in detail, he said to one of his adjutants. And then he turned to the Duke of Württemberg, who was standing behind him. May I ask your highness to accept command of the First Army? Soon after the Duke's departure, so soon that he could not yet have reached Semyonovskoye, the Duke's adjutant came back from him and reported to his serenity that the Duke requested more troops. Kutuzov winced and sent an order to Dokturov to assume command of the First Army and asked the Duke to come back, saying he could no more do without him in these important moments. When news was brought that Murat had been taken prisoner and the staff officers congratulated Kutuzov, he smiled. Wait, gentlemen, he said. The battle is won, and the capture of Murad is nothing extraordinary, but we'd better wait before we reduce, rejoice. 
However, he sent an adjutant to spread this news among the troops. When Scherbenin came galloping from the left flank with a report that the French had taken the flesh and Semyonovskoye, Kutuzov, guessing by the sounds from the battlefield and Scherbenin's face that the news was bad, got up as if to stretch his legs and taking Scherbenin's arm, led him aside. Go there, dear boy, he said to Ermolov. See if anything can be done. Kutuzov was in Gorky, at the center of the Russian army's position. Napoleon's attack against our left flank had been, had been repulsed several times. In the center, the French had moved no further than Barodino. On their left flank, Uvarov's cavalry had put the French to flight. After two o'clock, the French attack ceased. On all the faces of those who came from the battlefield and of those who stood around him, Kutuzov read an expression of tension. And that had reached the highest degree. Kutuzov was pleased with the success of the day, which was beyond expectation. But the old man's physical powers were failing him. Several times, his head dropped as if falling, and he dozed off. They served him dinner. The imperial adjutant, Volz again, the same one who, riding past Prince Andrea, had said that the war should be in Raum Verlegen, and whom Bagration hated so much, rode up to Kutuzov during dinner. Volz again came from Barclay with a report on the course of things from the left flank. The sensible Barclay de Tolly, seeing crowds of retreating wounded and disorderly rearguard of the army, having weighed all the circumstances, decided that the battle was lost and sent his favorite to the commander in chief with that information. Kutuzov was chewing roast chicken with difficulty and glanced at Volz again with narrowed, merry eyes. Volz again, stretching his legs casually with a half contemptuous smile on his lips, went up to Kutuzov, touching the visor of his cap slightly. Volz again treated his serenity with a certain affected casualness intended to show that, he, as a highly educated military man, he left it to the Russians to make an idol of this old, useless man while he knew whom he was dealing with. Der alte Herr, as the Germans call Kutuzov in their circle, mag sich ganz bequem, thought Volz again. And glancing sternly at the plates in front of Kutuzov, he began to report to the old gentleman the state of things on the left flank, as Barclay had ordered him to do, and as he himself had seen and understood it. All the points of our position are in the hands of the enemy, and they cannot be repulsed, because there are no troops. They are running away, and it is not possible to stop them, he reported. Kutusev stopped chewing, and in, a, in astonishment, as if not understanding what he'd been told, fixed his eyes on Volz again. Volz again, noticing the agitation, der Alten Herrn said with a smile, I, I did not consider it right for me to conceal from your serenity what I saw, the troops in total <coughs> disarray. You saw? You saw, Kutuzov shouted, frowning and rising quickly. He went up close to Volz again. How, how dare you, he shouted, making threatening gestures with his trembling hands and sputtering. How dare you, dear sir, say that to me? You know nothing. Tell General Barclay from me that his information is incorrect and the true course of the battle is known better to me, the Commander-in-Chief, than to him. Volz again was about to make some suggestion, but Kusov cut him off. The enemy has been repulsed on the left and beaten on the right flank. If you see so poorly, my dear sir, don't allow yourself to speak of what you don't know. Kindly go to General Barclay and tell him that I firmly intend to attack the army tomorrow, Kutuzov said sternly. Everyone fell silent, and nothing was heard but the heavy breathing of the puffing old gentleman. They've been repulsed everywhere, 
for which I thank God and our brave enemy. The enemy is defeated, and tomorrow we will begin driving him out of the Holy Land, said Kutusov, crossing himself, and he suddenly choked from the tears welling up in him. Waltz again, shrugging his shoulders and twisting his lips, silently slipped stepped away, surprised über dieser Eigenomenheit des alten Herrn. Yes, here he is, my hero, said Kutuzov to the stout, handsome, black-haired general who was coming up onto the barrow at that moment. This was Rayevsky, who had spent the whole day at the main point of the field in Baradino. Rayevsky reported that the troops had stood their ground firmly and that the French no longer dared attack. Having heard him out, Kutuzov said in French, Vous ne pensez donc pas comme les autres que nous sommes obligés de nous retirer? Au contraire, votre Altesse, dans les affaires indécises, c'est toujours le plus opinette qui reste victorieux, replied Rabievsky. Et mon opinion, Kaiserov, Kutuzov called his adjutant, sit down and write the order for tomorrow, and you, he turned to another, ride to the line and announce that tomorrow we attack. While the conversation with Ryevsky was going on and the order was being dictated, Volz again came back from Barclay and reported that General Barclay de Tolly would like to have written confirmation of the order given by the field marshal. Kutusov, without glancing at Volz again, ordered the order to be written, which, on very good grounds to avoid personal responsibility, the former commander-in-chief wished to have. And by some indefinable, mysterious connection which maintains the same mood throughout an entire army, and which is known as the spirit of the army, and constitutes the central nerve of war, Kutusov's words, his order to fight the next day, were conveyed simultaneously to all ends of the army. It was far from the same words, the same order that passed through to the last links of that chain. There was even no resemblance between the stories that were passed on from man to man at different ends of the army and what Kutusov had said. But the sense of his words communicated itself everywhere because what Kutusov had said came not from clever considerations, but from the feeling that was in the soul of the commander-in-chief, just as it was in the soul of every Russian man. And learning that we would attack the enemy the next day, hearing from the high spheres of the army the confirmation of what they had wanted to believe, the exhausted, vacillating men were comforted and reassured.
thank you so much to all of the readers and to our wonderful musicians. Our last passage reminds us that after times of war, there always comes a time of peace. Um, in the previous piece, we found out that there are many ways of seeing. There are ways of seeing with our eyes, and then there is a way of seeing the inner truth. Kutuzov saw the inner truth, that the possibility of the Russian victory is imminent. We begin War and Peace in 1805. Our characters grow up in front of our eyes. We lose a few characters, and the next passage was edited very cleverly, not to reveal just who we lose and who we retain by the end of the novel, so that all of you would um, go ahead and read War and Peace all to yourselves. Um, it's 1814. Our characters are all grown up. Our characters are married. Our characters are having new babies. Um, some of the characters who have passed away gave their names to the babies that will be born to the two couples that we encounter in the first epilogue. Um, once again, this piece has been edited. You will find out about one married couple, and we have to reveal to you the significance of this marriage. Tolstoy was two years old when his mother passed away. He was nine years old when his father died. He had virtually no recollection of his parents. And this marvelous novel that we believe was written about the glorious victory of the Russian people over Napoleon in 1812, this marvelous novel that takes us through many battlefields of the Napoleonic Wars, is actually a very personal journey for Tolstoy. He tells us of the marriage of his mom and dad. I always like to tell my students that his full name is Russian was Graf Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy. Nikolai was the name of his dad, and we already encountered Nikolai in the second volume when he is um, watching Natasha dance and approving of her every move. Nikolai and Maria get married at the end of the novel because Nikolai and Maria are Tolstoy's mom and dad. So in the novel, the character's name is Prince Princessa or uh, Knyazhna Princess Maria Balkonskaya. His real mother's name was Knyazhna Maria Balkonskaya. He changed but one um, consonant in her last name. Nikolai and Maria are having a wonderful conversation and um, at the end of the novel about their children, they have a little daughter whose name is Natasha. She's three years old, so that enchantress Natasha that we meet in volume one is resurrected all of a sudden in a three-year-old little niece. <coughs> Natasha is Papa's favorite. Um, Maria and Nikolai are going to have a wonderful conversation and yet at the end, Maria will bring us back to seeing something that is beyond the here and now. And we are going to conclude with the second movement of Beethoven's Pathétique. Thank you so much for coming. From the room where Nikolai was sleeping, his wife could hear his regular breathing, familiar to her down to the smallest nuances. Hearing that breathing, she saw before her his smooth, handsome forehead, his mustache, his whole face, which she so often gazed at for a long time while he slept in the silence of the night. Nikolai suddenly stirred and grunted, and at the same time, Andrusha shouted through the door, Papa! Mama! Standing here! Countess Maria turned pale from fright and began making signs to her son. He fell silent, and this silence, so terrible for Countess Maria, went on for about a minute. She knew how much Nikolai disliked being awake. Suddenly, from behind the door came a new grunt, movement, and the displeased voice of Nikolai said, They don't give me a moment's peace. Marie, is that you? Why have you brought him here? I only came to look. I didn't see. Excuse me. Nikolai cleared his throat and fell silent. Countess Maria stepped away from the door and took her son to the nursery. Five minutes later, unnoticed by her mother, the three-year-old, dark-eyed little Natasha, her father's favorite, having learned from her brother that Papa was sleeping in Mama's sitting room, ran to her father. The dark-eyed little girl boldly opened the creaking door, went up to the sofa, stepping energetically on her blunt little feet and making out the position of her father who was sleeping with his back to her, got up on tiptoe and kissed his hand which lay under his head. Nikolai turned with a tender smile on his face. 
Natasha, Natasha, Countess Maria's frightened whisper was heard through the door. Papa wants to sleep. No, Mama, he doesn't want to sleep, little Natasha answered. He's laughing. <laughs> Nikolai lowered his feet, sat up, and took his daughter in his arms. Come in, Masha, he said to his wife. And Countess Maria went in and sat down by her husband. I didn't see him run after me, she, he, um, she said timidly. I'm so sorry. Nikolai, holding his daughter with one arm, glanced at his wife and noticing the guilty expression on her face, put his other arm around her and kissed her on the hair. May I kiss Mama? he asked Natasha. Natasha smiled shyly. Again, she said, pointing with an imperious gesture to the place where Nikolai had kissed his wife. I don't know why you think I'm in a bad humor, said Nikolai, answering the question that he knew was in his wife's mind. Oh, you can't imagine how unhappy and not lonely I am when you're like that. It always seems to me, oh, enough silliness, Marie. Shame on you, he said gaily. It seems to me that you can't love me because I'm so plain, always. And now, in this condition, ah, how funny you are. Not dear for being pretty, but pretty for being dear. Men only love Malvina and the like because they're beautiful. But do I love my wife? It's not love, but just, I don't know how to tell you. Without you, or like today when there's some falling out between us, it's as if I'm lost and can't do anything. Well, do I love my finger? I don't love it, but just try cutting it off. <laughs> no, I'm not like that, but I understand. So you're not angry with me? Oh, terribly angry, he said, smiling and standing up. And smoothing his hair, he started pacing the room. Do you know what I'm thinking about, Maria? He began, now that they were reconciled, beginning at once to think aloud in his wife's presence. He did not ask whether she was prepared to listen to him. It made no difference. The thought had occurred to him, which meant to her, too. And he told her of his intentions to persuade Pierre to stay with them until spring. Countess Maria heard him out, made her comments, and in turn began to think her thoughts aloud. Her thoughts were about the children. Oh, how one sees the woman in her even now, she said in French, pointing to Natasha. You re reproach us women for being illogical. Here's our logic. I say to her, Papa wants to sleep. And she says, no, he's laughing. And she's right, Countess Maria said, smiling happily. Yes, yes, said Nikolai, taking his daughter in his strong hands. He lifted her up, seated her on his shoulder, and holding her legs, began walking about the room with her. Both father and daughter had the same senselessly happy faces. But you know, you're being unfair. You love this one too much, Countess Maria whispered in French. Yes, but what can I do? I try not to show it. Just then, the sounds of the door pulley and footsteps came from the front hall and the anteroom, like the sounds of an arrival. Someone's come. Oh, I'm certain it's Pierre. I'll go and find out, said Countess Maria, and she went out of the room. In her absence, Nikolai allowed himself to give his daughter a gallop around the room. Out of breath, he quickly set down the laughing girl and hugged her to his breast. His leaps reminded him of dancing, and looking at the child's round, happy face, he thought of how she would be when he, as an old man, started taking her out and would do the mazurka with her, as his late father used to dance the Daniel Cooper with his daughter. It's him, it's him, Nicholas, Countess Maria said a few minutes later, coming back into the room. Well, come along, come along quickly. To part, finally, she said, smiling and looking at the little girl who pressed herself to her father. Nikolai went out, holding his daughter by the hand. Countess Maria stayed in the sitting room. Never, never would I have believed, she whispered to herself, that one could be so happy. Her face shone with a smile. 
but at the same time she sighed and her profound gaze showed a quiet sadness. As if besides the happiness she experienced, there was another happiness unattainable in this life, which she involuntarily remembered at this moment. 